Hello, this is Francesca Vigliani from Cloud Academy. Thank you for joining us for this webinar on GDPR compliance. I'd like to welcome George Gertrau, Chief Security Officer at Sumo Logic, and Jen Brown, Data Protection Officer at Sumo Logic. George and Jen have an incredible amount of hands-on experience and expertise with data security, privacy, and compliance. So we are very excited that they're joining us today to talk about GDPR and explain how the world will change after May 25th. Welcome to George and Jen. Great, thanks Francesca, I appreciate the introduction and speaking for both Jen and I, we are so excited to, to do this webinar and to talk about some of our practical experiences you mentioned before and to be working with a thought leader like Cloud Academy in this space. So thank you very much and let's go on to get into it and get into it. So one of the places that we have to start, as Francesca mentioned, is we work for a company called Sumo Logic, and it's important to understand who Sumo Logic is from a back-end perspective. So we're a very highly regulated and secure company that was born in AWS eight years ago. And when I mean highly regulated, I'm talking highly regulated. You know, I came from um, the, the government contracting space, financial space. Jen has a similar background as well, too. And in no environment have I ever been in have we had this much scrutiny over security because cloud computing is an emotional transition for a lot of people. So just to give you an idea of the certifications and asset stations and some of the ways that we do security, you know, we just went through our fifth year of PCI, right, Jen? We finally got that done <laughs> last week. You know, SOC 2 Type 2 multiple times, ISO 27001, which multiple times as well, too. CSA Star, you know, HIPAA High Tech for PHI and our healthcare customers, EU Privacy Shield, which affects this subject matter and we'll speak to later on. And then everything within our environments is encrypted, whether it's in motion or whether it's at rest, our entire environment's a CDE, so everything's encrypted. So it gives you a great idea of our pedigree. And so when things like GDPR started emerging a few years ago, we take it very seriously and we know that our customers are going to expect just the highest level of security and they're going to expect for us to be able to meet the demands of any kind of regulatory compliance or governance that's starting to take place across the globe. Now, good news is, uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Jen here in a few seconds for comments on this slide, is that Jen actually runs these programs uh, for Sumo. And so, you know, it's a, it's a good thing and a bad thing, which we'll talk about later on within the, the, the presentation itself. But Jen, any, any thoughts around this slide and, you know, your experience at Sumo Logic when it comes to security and compliance? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, being so regulated and having so many security controls already in place is, I'm not going to say it's made the jump to GDPR easy because, you know, that would, that would be a, an incredible uh, wrong thing to say, but having those controls in place have really helped us with our GDPR uh, compliance because we already have, you know, the, the security processing address. We are already an environment that knows how to take controls and Im implement them. So it, it's been an easier transition than maybe an environment that doesn't have um, very many um, regulations or standards that they're, they're complying to. That, that, that's, that's just a, such a great point, you know, Jen, you know, because like one of the things that people talk about all the time is the, you know, the, how it's all like 80 to 90 percent process and procedures and policies, which you and I both know is true. And, you know, if anyone has some of these regulations just like we do, and then that means that they've won part of the battle. And I know you're going to talk about that later on, but it's very, very true. And then if you flip the coin to the tech side. You know, if you have some of this tech in place today to meet some of these regulatory requirements, it also puts you into a really good position. So that's, that's just a great mention for sure. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning. <laughs> and, and so I like to call it the privacy panic, you know, because again, you know, I was sitting around with uh, some, of, some of the folks in our PM team and, and a couple guys in engineering and, and gals in engineering, and we were, you know, going through what our future roadmap was gonna be around regulatory compliance and security. And this was 2016, and we, you know, we were talking a lot about FedRAMP at the time, you know, which, you know, which by the way, we're going down that path as well too. We didn't have that on that list, but we were talking about FedRAMP at the time, and then someone ended up mentioning, you know, this four-letter acronym called GDPR, and we literally sat in a conference room and stared at articles on a big screen and read about it for almost four to six hours. And you know, we knew at the time that it was going to have a heavy impact on us since we are a global company. But even if you're not a global company, this was going to have a tremendous effect because 
you're de dealing with vendors who are global. You're, you're going to have people within your organization that possibly come from the EU, that it's not just citizens, it's also residents. So there's just so much to try to consume. And, you know, the, the thing that stood out to me immediately, you know, and again, we'll, we'll get Jen's point of view here in a second, but was that this was about privacy, you know, privacy by design, and that GDPR was just going to be the very beginning of this journey. You know, so we were going to have to work very hard on our privacy program, and we were going to have to get buy-in uh, from, you know, my peers on, on the executive staff and the board as well, too. You know, and one of the things that we all agreed on, you know, because we came out of that room uh, sort of just, <laughs> it was daunting the way that it felt, but we knew that there was two things that we were going to do for sure. Number one was going to be to establish a mature privacy program. We already had one, but to me, it felt like a checkbox, you know, and in most organizations, it feels that way. Like, hey, we have a privacy program. This is how data is handled, blah, blah, blah. Nothing that was really impactful. And that had to change because as other regulations emerge, we wanted to be able to set a baseline and do a gap analysis and either accept the risk, remediation, and be able to deal with these new emerging uh, privacy programs or, or privacy regulations that would emerge around, around the globe. The second thing that really stood out, you know, in my mind, you know, was we need a DPO. We need someone who's going to come in here and own this thing, you know, so someone who's going to drive the program throughout the organization, someone who's going to take the far, far right on everything privacy and GDPR, someone that's going to lead the way and get buy-in from every single line of business. And there was this question, and by the way, this just came up, I was meeting with a, a CISO uh, in Denver, you know, on, on Monday. And he was talking about um, how he's third, you know, he has a third party contract out with a DPO. And he was asking me, he's like, wow, is it really worth it for, you know, to, you to get one internally? And we'll bring up this discussion quite a bit because it was an interesting conversation we had with him. And I was like, yes, you know, for us, we had to do it. Like, it's not for everyone. Like, I, I think it's okay. And in fact, where he's at, it's probably okay to have one come in and consult or have one on retainer. But if you're going to be serious about this and you are a global company and you are going to start picking up PII from across the globe um, from customers and internal employees, you've got to have this kind of ownership and leadership within your company. And this is a true leader. This is a leader within the organization that everyone has to get, buy into their program. And so we knew we had to get somebody. Um, and for us, again, you know, being the type of company we are, Silicon Valley based, you know, exploding company, one of the biggest things that mattered to us and to me and to our team, and Jen could talk about this as well too, is it had to be someone who fit into our culture. You know, so it had to be someone who brought in some privacy skills, knew compliance really, really well, had been a proven leader somewhere else that could go out and get buy-in from our different lines of business. And so this was kind of the approach that we had um, in the beginning, you know, and, and I feel like, and Jen, here's where I'm going to hand it back off to you and ask you a question around it. Jen, what, what are you seeing as far as people hiring DPOs out there? I get some a feeling sometimes that people just kind of walk through the organization, tap on someone's shoulder that wants to make a move and say, hey, by the way, you know, I know that you've been running our ITIL service desk or, you know, uh, running all of our maintenance services <laughs> in our facilities. You're now the DPO. What, what are your thoughts around that? That's that's what I'm seeing most of the time too. Uh, you know, the people that have reached out to me, my peers, uh, it, it, most of them are people who have been running some kind of audit program, security program. Uh, they're a one man shop already, and that's exactly what's happening is they're getting tapped on the shoulder and saying, now in addition to all these other things you own, you're now going to own GDPR, which um, you know is, is a daunting task. You know, there's a you know 99 articles, 173 recitals. It's a lot to learn, and if you you know like me. You've got PCI and SOC and ISO, and it's, it's another big pile of controls and things to worry about. So um, I, I do have a few friends who are privacy lawyers who are being contracted out as a virtual DPO for several small companies. But I think for the most part, it's uh, people are being tapped on the shoulder, just like you said. Yeah, you know, that's a very interesting point too, Jen. And, you know, I know we're going to discuss it throughout the, the call, but the whole idea of a privacy attorney, you know, so should the privacy attorney be a DPO? Do you contract that skill out? And, and let me give you my thoughts and then um, I'll ask you for yours. You know, my thoughts were if we could get someone that is already close to the lines of business, already understands how compliance programs work, has a privacy background, has a real acclimate for this growing space, can be a leader there. That's the direction I wanted to go in. We, we, as you know, we have, you know, a privacy attorney on retainer. We work with her quite closely. Um, she was tremendous, you know, help when it came to our DPA. Um, but, but my thought was, you know, twofold was one, I wanted to have someone 
on our team that could lead the way throughout the organization. And then the other was the reporting structure. You know, a lot of times when you bring in a, a privacy attorney, they're going to report to risk or to the CFO. And, and from my point of view, it was important for us to work together and collaborate from a security perspective, a compliance perspective. So then that way there's not silos and people aren't kind of like throwing the ball over the fence, you know, to another side of the organization instead of collaborating and working closely together to get things done. So what's, what's your whole point of view on the attorney being the DPO or how the attorney and DPO should report? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. As I, as I talk to a lot of my friends in the industry, be the, uh, you know, like me, who've got a security and compliance background who've rolled into this role or, uh, like I said, I've got several friends who are privacy lawyers, and I've, I've talked to them about it, and it, it really varies uh, all the way across the board to I've got a few who are very, you know, must be privacy lawyer, and then I've got a couple of friends who are privacy lawyers that said, no, 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 it should never be a privacy lawyer. It should be someone in compliance that then goes back to the privacy lawyer for, you know, questions around legal. So it's 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 really, really interesting. For me, I know it's been, obviously, I'm not a lawyer. So I don't have that perspective, but for me, it's been really helpful to have my compliance background, my security background, because it is about implementing controls, not necessarily technical controls, some of them policy procedures, things that I have spent, you know, almost 20 years now doing. And um, it's, it's like you and I talk about all the time. It's, it's like a new recipe book. So now I've got a new recipe of, of things that I need to put into place. Um, you know, lawyers, they've got a different skill set. Not that I, I'm saying that a lawyer can't do that, but it just that's my day in and day out job. So it's it's um, been kind of a natural progression for me, but it, it is really, really interesting to talk to people throughout the field because everyone's got an opinion on it and, and nobody's opinions are the same. So um, I know for me, it's been really great. Uh, when I went through IAPP training, there were 27 of us, only four of us were not lawyers. And it felt like to me, and this is not a slam on lawyers, but it felt like to me that those of us that were not lawyers and maybe we were just overcompensating seemed to be a little bit further down the path of being ready for GDPR than those that, that were in that privacy attorney space. So, and again, not a slam on privacy lawyers. I love them. They're, they're valuable. <laughs> awesome. That, that's a, that's a great point of view, you know, from, from the training that you've had. So we'll, we're definitely going to talk about that on this slide here for sure. You know, so, you know, again, I'll, I'll, I'll take the lead on this slide and just start talking about, what it felt like, you know, when you came in, you know, so one of the things that, that we ended up doing was we started a search um, for the right fit with someone being a DPO in mind. And I, I mean, we hit, went through over a hundred different applications, candidates, um, about 10 of them got to me and I just didn't feel it. And, and it wasn't that they were just missing something, you know, it was either a, a, a cultural miss, but most of it is exactly what Jen just said, which was, they really had no experience in privacy and they couldn't run a overall compliance program. And then also not much of a security background. So one of those three things was, was missing. And so we got really, 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 really lucky, you know, and I'm thankful to this day, you know, like Jen and I collaborate so much for communication all day long um, that we ran across Jen through a mutual friend of ours that was actually helping us out with an ISO audit. And so we got to give Casey props here. <laughs> and so like when, when she made that introduction, um, we just hit it off. I mean, I, I think the first time I talked to Jen, we talked for almost two hours on the phone. Um, but then again, you know, we wanted to make sure this was the right move for our organization as well as what other people were doing. And again, this is like 2016, started turning into 2017. So it's pretty early on. Um, and so the first thing we did was like, look, okay, so we're going to go ahead and give you like our crown jewels, which is PCI. PCI is our crown jewels. You know, we have the self-service portal that we built out for um, evidence of associations and certifications. And PCI is like the number two download we have right now besides uh, our, our PCI AOC, besides our DPA. And so um, having Jen run our, our PCI program, she knocked it out of the park. She developed a relationship with engineering. Uh, she started getting getting trust from ESAP and other leaders. And engineering is not easy, especially in Silicon Valley based companies. It could be tough, right? Because they're, they're, they're a little bit snooty. And I'll just go ahead and say that and I'll leave it at that for a second, but they're a little bit difficult to break down those walls. They're already introverted people anyway. And then, you know, of course, you know, a lot of times they, they overvalue themselves mentally. So it's a little bit different and tough to be able to engage with some of those folks. And so one of the things that, you know, after we had her come in, she established her leadership, knocked out GDPR, we brought her in full time. Um, she really started working hard on the privacy program. And I'll let her talk about that here in a second and, and got buy-in from everyone that, 
things were going to start coming down the pike. And, and one of the things that we had pre-planned before Jen came on board, and this is critical, you know, and this is one of those things that you, know, you can look at Cloud Academy for as well too. You know, we did a blog series and then now we have this webinar and we're gonna probably do a couple more webinars, but then, you know, there's gonna be a training released around this as well too, uh, where Jen and I are gonna be major contributors to um, getting this kind of privacy training is absolutely critical. And so we knew we wanted her to get it. Um, difficult for some folks to do, and again, you can look at Cloud Academy to be able to do these things in the future, but we felt like we had to send her overseas. We wanted her to experience being over the pond, working with people very, very closely that you know were right in it, you know, living it, breathing it in the EU on a daily basis, and we feel like that that, that training was invaluable. Most people aren't getting any kind of training around privacy. You know, and a lot of the tra training that I see today is, is FUD. You know, so we want to make sure that, you know, the person who gets this role gets some kind of training and other people within the organization too. Like we even have our legal person, contracts person wanting to get some training as well too. And we'll point her at Cloud Academy here in the future once we got that course ready to go. But it's critical. And then the certifications and training doesn't end. You know, it's like all over the globe like we talked about before. So Jen, it'd be really interesting to get your thoughts and kind of reflecting back on, you know, how you came on board, what that training was like, building out that privacy program and working with different lines of business within Sumo. Yeah, so as, as George mentioned, you know, we, we, we spoke in, I think, in August of 2016, and at that point, he was already bringing up GDPR, which was just four months after it was passed into law, which uh, really impressed me. We decided to do a, a kind of try before you buy with each other, uh, make sure that we, we collaborated well, and so, like you said, I, I did their PCI audit. I was really impressed with Sumo in that, um, Everywhere else I've ever worked, I've had to go and um, almost chase down and, and cattle tie engineers to get them to talk to me. But at uh, Sumo, the engineers were coming to me on their own, knocking on the door and saying, hey, can we talk to you about this? And it was very impressive to me. So um, came on a year ago. Yesterday was my, my one year. And uh, immediately uh, I worked with uh, George and his boss to get signed up for the IAPP training. I started working on the privacy program. And you know, got the buy-in, like George said. You know, I work. I've been working closely with sales. I've been working closely with engineering. Marketing is another big thing. Um, working on this program. This program is different from any other in that normally with a PCR or ISO, you're looking at mostly your production environment. GDPR, you're looking at every aspect of your business, especially if you've got employees in EMEA. So GDPR is different than other. Um, audits and, and compliance type efforts you're going to take on. But uh, it, it's been an incredible ride. But like he said, that buy-in has been critical. If I didn't have that buy-in, I didn't have that faith, people didn't look at me and have the faith that I could execute on this, I, I, would, I would be nowhere. Um, we're in a really great position. And that is not only because of me, it is because of the entire Sumologic team. Great. And, and that, that's just such a good perspective, Jen. You know. Uh, one of the things that I want to make sure that we point out here on this as well, too, is the training is awesome. It's great that you went out there and got that. Um, but some of the training that you're going to see now coming from folks like us in Cloud Academy as well, too, is practical hands on. You know, so even though it's tremendous to get this high level, great privacy training over the pond, right in the middle of it. Now you want to take the next step, you know, and, and get deep training, you know, like with, with people who have their hands on, who are living it and breathing it every single day. Correct, correct. So the, the training that I did, and it, it was incredible, um, it, but it was four days. And it, so it was two classes over the course of four days, so two days each. It was a lot of information to try to digest, especially being jet lagged. Um, you know, if I had to do it again, I would have loved to have done something a little bit more like this, but there just weren't options at that time. So um, I, I'm really thrilled that we're, we're we're working with Cloud Academy to try to provide something that's um, a little more accessible to most people and probably a little bit more digestible, quite honestly, as well. That's awesome. So what to do about a DPA? You know, and, and we're going to wrap all this up here in a second with the practical steps. But a DPA was an absolutely critical thing to us in our organization. As early as the beginning of 2017, we started just getting crushed with EU model clauses and people pushing their DPAs on us. And these things were ridiculous. And again, a DPA is a data processing agreement. Sometimes you see them as data processing addendum, like Salesforce has theirs, but just getting absolutely hammered with these things. And I mean, one of the things that I noticed was 
they'd have every article listed, you know, in general comment on this in a second, but every single article, every single point of view, and people wanted you to just give up the keys of the kingdom. You know, like you're gonna take over my business and, and keep me from doing business. And one of the things I wanna make sure we discuss here, Jen, is the whole processor, sub-processor relationship and how people can object and some of the pain that we had around that in our DPA and what that means to a SaaS-based company because it's not one size fits all, right? Every business is a little bit different. You know, we'll get into the same thing when we talk about data subject rights, but it could cripple your business. And, and this is the way that I saw it, you know, as, as a leader in our company was, if we sit here and deal with all these inbound DPAs, we're gonna go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth on redlining between us, the legal, back to us, back to the customer. And it was just gonna become overwhelming. you know. And, and again, our point of view is mostly from the processor side, even though we have a controller aspect as well too. But just the time and effort, and you know, most people are gonna be throwing FTEs at this. I heard this on Monday, someone was like, I'm just gonna throw FTEs at that, you know, which is not the way that we function, right? We're always looking to automate things and just become more efficient, you know, and that, that's one of the reasons why we're doing this today is hopefully to share some ideas on efficiencies when it comes to this. So it started crippling our business. And then, you know, finally, you know, we went out and did things like EU Privacy Shield. We do this every single year. So what does that really mean when it comes to EU model clauses? And, you know, does it add value to GDPR? And how does that fit in? And then finally, when you are writing up a DPA, because this is something that you should consider, how are you gonna react to DPAs? How are you gonna write up your own? Do you need one? Do you need two? Being a processor, being a controller. And, and then again, you know, like once you have it written, you know, you get it approved, you, you work with an attorney on the outside, you share it, you know, with, with as many people as possible, obviously under um, NDA, but then you rinse, lather, and repeat. You're going to constantly improve it. You know, it's not one of those things that stops, just like GDPR in general or privacy in general. You have to have a roadmap. You have to constantly fine tune, but get something out there, you know, and especially if you're on the processor side, get something out there before May 25th or else you're going to become inundated with JIRA tickets, most likely, or any kind of ServiceNow tickets, you know, from your, your, your customers um, and potential clients on DPAs and how they want to hold you accountable for hand, handling their data. So, Jen, I know that you have a ton of thoughts on this and you were critical in helping with the DPA, so go for it. Yeah, when we, like you said, when we first started getting pressured, the DPAs, uh, the contract and legal department and I trying to redline, and I hadn't gone through the training yet. I was reading everything online that I could find, every book that was published, uh, but there was still a lot that I just, I wasn't sure of. And so trying to redline these DPAs was really, uh, quite honestly, overwhelming. I kept wondering, am I going to make a mistake? Am I going to cripple the company? Am I, how much liability am I putting us at? And uh, so again, the training was critical for that. But you're know, working with, uh, with, with our legal department uh, contracts, you know, like George said, we, we have outside counsel, but our, our contracts, we're not lawyers. So we had tried to write our own DPA, and it was, a, quite honestly, a bit disastrous. We're not lawyers. So going and knocking on George's door and saying, hey, I think we need to take this to outside counsel, uh, I wish I'd done it sooner, but going and getting that template from outside counsel was a lifesaver. Another thing that they they suggested that we do, and we're so glad for it, like George said, is we actually have two DPAs. We have one where we're the processor, our customers are the controllers, so we give that to our customers. We have another one where we're the, the controller, and our vendors, the sub-processors, are the processor. So that's a really important uh, a thing to point out, and as George said, is uh, with HIPAA, some other things, you've got to roll your obligations downhill. With GDPR, it's really, really important that you look at all those vendors, that you're doing the data flows, and figuring out which of your vendors you need to sign that, that DPA with, where they're your sub-processor, because your customers are going to look for you to do that. They're going to ask for things like coming in and auditing your sub-processors, which you can push back on. It's, there's not a, you know, anything in GDPR that says that you have to give them that, that right. But they're going to ask for everything under the sun. They're going to try to they being, you know, customers, they're going to try to offload as much liability to you. So it's really important to make sure you've got a rock solid DPA or as you're reviewing your customers' DPAs, you're not just blind, blindly signing them because it is a lot of liability. It is a lot of risk. So you want to make sure that with those data processing addendums that you're really reviewing them and making sure that you understand what your responsibilities are versus the other party's responsibility. And there will be cases where you're the controller, someone else is the processor, you're both controllers, you're both processors, there's 
all sorts of uh, uh, different ways this can pan out, but uh, normally it's going to be a processor to controller or controller to you know, processor. So um, know your rights, know your obligations, and, and, and make sure that you're clearly communicating that and being transparent with the other party. That's, that's the big thing with GDPR is transparency. Yeah, that's a great point. Transparency and best level of effort, you know, on anything that you're doing. Um, if you do those two things and then life should be good moving forward. And you brought up such a great point around when to engage the privacy attorney. You know, it, it, it's important to engage the privacy attorney up front when it comes to things like a DPA. You know, it, it's hard to figure out sometimes when do I need to engage them, when I need to have them involved. Uh, it's really, really, really tough on some organizations to understand what that timing looks like for a privacy attorney, because obviously it, it's going to be something that's going to be a little bit costly to the organization. And then you want to make sure that it's just tight, that conversation and what it is that they bring and add value to. So great points around that. And, and I, again, I agree, we should have probably done that a little bit sooner. And that's one of those things that most people on the call can benefit from. So this yeah, one just real quick to add to that while you were saying, you know, it is it is costly to go to the attorney at the same time, like you said, keep it tight and everything. It's it's invaluable. I mean, getting that help is is really worth its its weight in gold. So I just wanted to to add that in. It it's been really important for us. Absolutely. And and Jen, you know, so this is one of those areas where you you were so awesome for us. Most organizations, so for those of you listening today. There are things that you've already knocked out, you know, for sure, when it comes to GDPR and privacy in general. And, and so, you know, like Jen brought all the articles together and said, these are the ones that we probably have covered. Uh, these are the ones that people should start taking a look at. And then here's the big bad boy of them all that everyone wants to talk about. So I'm just going to hand it off to you, Jen, let you run with the slide, and then I'll add commentary at the end. Okay, great. So you know, as George said, there were some things that we were able to go, hey, we've got this covered. Article 32 talks about the security processing. It doesn't really call out specific technical controls. It doesn't say thou shall have ISO 27000 certification, which has been a help to us, but it's not something that you have to have. But having the program that we have in place has been very, very helpful. Article 33, data breach notification. I was very surprised when I did go to training that my European counterparts were all terrified of this one. It's something that they don't traditionally do in Europe, and I didn't realize this. And they were very scared about it. And it was it was kind of interesting that my instructor was like, let's have the American talk about it a little bit, because we as Americans are a little bit known more for this. We're already ahead of the curve there. Now, some of the controls that we had partly in place, but needed to, to you know, get a bit more background on were um, we have, you know, Security by design at Sumo Logic, but adding in that privacy by design. It's not only privacy by design, but also by default. And I, I laughed when, I didn't laugh, but when Fitbit had their breach, my first thought was if they had had privacy by design and by default in place, all that sensitive military top secret information probably wouldn't have leaked out. Now, maybe it still would have, but if it was enabled by design and by default, instead of uh, you have to go change this, that may have not happened. Uh, Article 30 is one that a lot of people just are not sure where to start with. And uh, it's really kind of a foreign concept to most people who don't have a, a privacy background. But what you need to do is you need to know where your data is flowing through your organization. Again, not just in that um, production environment, but any kind of PI and, and sales through your, your CRM, Salesforce or whatever else you may use, in marketing through items like Marketo. HR, like I said, if you've got a MIA uh, employees, you need to know where that potential personal data or special category data is flowing through. And then what you need to do is you need to map those flows. You need to map who owns that, what kind of data is being collected, why is it being collected, those types of things. It sounds uh, very daunting, and it can be, but it's very important and fundamental to understanding your, your environment and where you've got risk. Uh, Article 35, doing your data uh, protection impact assessments. This is another important one. And until you know where your data is and how that data inventory and how it flows, almost impossible to, to do. But what you need to do with the, the DPIAs is where you are processing data and there's a high risk, you've got to do that impact assessment. Uh, you know, there's a lot of other articles, obviously, that you need to look at uh, within GDPR, but the ones that everybody is 
is our hair is on fire about are the data subject rights. So you've got articles 12 through 23. The one that everybody wants to talk to talk about is that right to erasure. So um, if you're familiar with them, it's everything from right to access, right to rectification, right to uh, erasure or for, to be forgotten, all sorts of rights. The thing that I took away from my training that uh, helped me start sleeping again at night was these data subject rights are not absolute. A lot of people don't realize that. So if a data subject comes to you and says, I would like to you to erase my data, if you've got a legal reason to continue processing that data, you are able to deny that request. Now you can't deny it just for no reason, but if you've got a reason like the PCI says I must keep this data for you know a year, or I'm a financial institution, I must keep it for seven, or if you need it for forensic reasons, you have a you have a legal right to keep that data and you are able to to say no to that subject access right so um you know understand what kind of data you have understand your legal retentions uh have that documented and then you'll be able to respond to those data subject rights uh much better instead of just uh you know throwing a dart and trying to guess whether or not you can uh you know, process that request or not those are fantastic points and let's dive in on a couple of those so Here's when we start hitting a little bit of tech, you know, and I always get asked that question, you know, George, what kind of tech did you have to procure for your company when it came to things like GDPR? Article 30 was one of those areas, Jen, where you surfaced it up pretty early and said, I think we're gonna need something here. We're gonna need something that shows consistent workflow in different areas of records of processing of data throughout lines of business. And so we went out and, and purchased a, a bit of tech around that from, from a partner of ours. Do you wanna talk about that briefly, Jen, and how we worked through that? Sure, sure. So we worked, uh, I looked at a couple of different uh, vendors out there. There's Nimity, there's OneTrust. We ultimately decided on TrustArc. And uh, part of that was just I like their product a little bit better. We also already work with them on our uh, cookie management and our EU privacy shield. And uh, this, this particular module, what it allows me to do is I've spent time going in and entering all our different business units, you know, people, we, we call HR people. So we've got people in the U.S., people in EMEA, people in APAC, uh, our engineering groups. And I even broke that down by, the, you know, so we've got platform, we've got collector, we've got all sorts of different uh, subgroups within engineering. So I spent the time to import all of those potential owners. And then, as I was saying before, you, you know, it allows you to step through. It makes it very easy. It breaks it down. What is this process? What is, you know, you put in a description of what exactly you're doing here. What kind of data are you collecting? Why are you collecting it? What kind of controls do you have around it? And then you create an actual flow. The best part about this particular program is at the end of it, it allows you to create an Article 30 report. So at the end, you've got this nice little PDF. You're able to give that to your customers if they do ask you to help with Article 30. You're able to provide your piece of the puzzle to them very easily. Yeah, it was outstanding, you know, and one of the ways that uh, Jen actually tested us, I'll never forget this, we were sitting at our offsite, and she goes, well, let's talk about our bug bounties and, and how we engage and what the data flow looks like with our bug bounties. And I was like, oh, geez, you know, we never really thought about that before, like how it goes from their portal and then how we account for it via ticketing back to engineering. And it, it's a very useful exercise in the visualization, as she said, when it comes to training, when you can actually sit down with another line of business that has no tech knowledge in HR, for example, which has been a tremendous partner of ours, by the way, in helping us advocate privacy and GDPR throughout the organization, no better partner than, than HR. She sat down with them and said, let's visualize this. And it really starts hitting home all the different steps and how to make those steps more efficient. So that's one of the areas that if you're a leader on the call and you're providing budget around GDPR, besides things like training, uh, and looking at DPOs and privacy attorneys and all that tech, you know, so look at some tech around Article 30. Jen mentioned a few there. There's a few other folks that do that, but that was one of those areas where we made an investment in tech right away. You mentioned EU Privacy Shield. I talked about it a little bit as well, too. Can you just give a description of the combination of EU Privacy Shield versus EU model clauses and what the right stance is on those, in your opinion? Sure. So, you know, we used to have Safe Harbor. Safe Harbor was invalidated and we were all a little bit in limbo there for a while. And that's where the model clauses came in. So everybody was signing model clauses left and right. Well, then EU Privacy Shield came along. And if you you know, went through the, the steps of getting certified with EU Privacy Shield, it's supposed to make it to where you didn't need to sign the model clauses. 
still there are a lot of customers that do want to sign those and uh, you know as our privacy attorney has said sometimes it's easier to not argue and, and go ahead and sign them than it is to try to argue the point um, but if you have EU Privacy Shield, it's my understanding that you don't need to necessarily sign the, the, the uh, EU model clauses. Now with GDPR, where EU Privacy Shield comes into play is you've got your adequacy decision. So if you are a company in Europe and you want to be able to send your data back to another country, there's got to be some kind of adequacy ruling. With uh, Canada, they are considered adequate. So if you sent your data back to Canada, you wouldn't have, any, have to have anything in place. U.S. is not considered adequate. Uh, people in EMEA are worried about our government getting a hold of their data, looking at it, things like that. So that's where EU Privacy Shield comes into play. So if you've got EU Privacy Shield, that helps with the adequacy. There's also binding corporate rules and, and the model clauses that can help with that as well. But you've got to have some kind of adequacy um, you know, control in place. And so that's where we're really leaning heavily on our EU Privacy Shield. There's been a lot of grumbling in uh, the privacy community as to whether or not EU Privacy Shield is going to uh, keep being upheld. Currently it is, it just went through a review, was not invalidated. We'll see what happens next year, but right now it is, it is still an adequacy control. That's great background. So stop and think about that for a second. You can actually take a stance to stop the influx of these inbound EU model clauses that are surfacing up everywhere if you go out and get something like EU Privacy Shield. As Jen mentioned, we were left a little bit high and dry like everyone else October of 2015 when, e, when uh, Safe Harbor went away. So it seemed like a natural progression for us and now it's even more natural to, to start wanting to not engage across the board on these EU model clauses if you've already done the fundamental work <laughs> you know, to prove out the way that you're handling data, you know, especially around things like data sovereignty. So again, really fantastic point of view. So Jen, I'll take the lead on this one, um, but to me, this is the path to early success, you know, and, and five different things that organizations can do, you still can do today, which we're gonna talk about some low hanging fruit here in a minute, but number one is engage a, a DPO. You were critical to us, still critical to us. We would have never gotten to where we are without you. So I think that that's key. And again, whether you choose the path of uh, getting one through contract or you would choose to hire one, make sure that you do this step one way or another because you're going to build your whole program based off of this. The next one is privacy by design. You know, so take what you currently have today, build on it to make sure that you account for any new emerging regulations. Make sure you account for things like Jen mentioned before, Article 30 and the processing of that data, what that looks like across the different lines of business, and you're going to do pretty well. The next one is privacy certifications. And, and again, there's two kinds here. You know, there's the ones where we sent Jen to, you know, where she went across the pond and she dealt with privacy attorneys and people right there in EMEA and how, you know, GDPR was gonna affect everything. But then there's also the ones that are gonna be more key in my mind, which are working with people hands-on that have actually done this before and that are continuing to, re to emerge their, their privacy program and evolve it over time. And so that's gonna be key moving forward as well too. And then the DPA, the data processing agreement. Make sure that either whether you're a controller or a processor, that you can either, as Jen mentioned, write your own or that you can react well to others that are inbound and that you, you look at them very, very closely to make sure that you're not giving up the keys of the kingdom. And then finally, this one to me is absolutely key, which is what GDPR articles do you cover today? Which GDPR articles are you working on? And then which ones are you gonna work on in the future? That roadmap is tremendous. So every time that Jen gets on the call with one of our customers, somebody internally, and we talk about the roadmap, this is never going to stop. You know, there's always area for improvement. So think about the fact that if you get audited, if you get audited by the EU and you are transparent, as Jen said, and you show best level of effort, and you have a roadmap saying these are the things that we're going to do moving forward. It means that you are all over it. You know, no one is perfect, but those things I think will be key. Jen, what are your thoughts around that? No, I absolutely agree. Absolutely agree with those. Uh, it, it's all about building up that program and, and making sure that uh, you've got all those key fundamental pieces. And these are all looking at these. They're all important to your foundation and framework of your program. Fantastic. Okay. So. This is something that everyone always asks us both about, which are lessons learned and things that we could have done better. So I'll go first here, Jen, and then hand it off to you. I think that we should have hired someone like you or you earlier. You know, when we first started talking about it, 
way back in 2016 and we started putting some things together around privacy and, and selling the motion internally, you should just pull the trigger. You know, this, this, this would have saved us a lot of time and effort down the line. And, and so again, that's why I have that as the number one thing in the path to success. Uh, the second thing, and, and again, this is a leadership issue, and, and we always have to look at ourselves and see what we could have done better. You didn't have to focus down to GDPR a little bit earlier. There was just too much on your plate. You know, we had you handling inbound questionnaires that every customer wants answered about how we're handling their data in the cloud, even though we have things like ISO 27001, SOC 2, CSA SAR, this goes on and on and on. But it was just too much too much going on at the time, you know, between PCI and ISO and then the security questionnaires and training, we should have narrowed that focus. So that's something that I could have done better was narrowed your focus more on GDPR, especially right when we hit 2018. And then the privacy training, we could have started that way early on in 2017. We could have started with something like Trust Arc and Article 30 and having those reviews with the different lines of business. I think that we should have jumped on that way, way sooner. And then another one here that you had mentioned before that looking back is that the tight work into the DPA and getting the attorney involved. And one thing we didn't mention about the attorney is most of your privacy attorneys today will have GDPR templates around DPAs for both processors and controllers. And that's another piece of extreme value so that you can set, you know, have a baseline and some guidance when you start building your own DPA. Jen, I'll hand it off to you to get your point of view. Yeah, definitely. Uh, when you talked about the narrowing of the focus, um, the privacy program fundamentals, I, I would have spent so much more time on those instead of focusing more on the data subject rights. The data subject rights were just, like you said, so in our face because everyone wanted to know what we were going to do around the right to be forgotten. Uh, it gotten to the point before I went to training, I was actually losing sleep because there was the whole inception like, it's not just our customers' data, but our customers, 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 customers. It, it just, it, you know, kind of flows down. And how are we ever going to do this? And what if they're not engineered right? And uh, I would have focused on those fundamental things like our inventory, our, you know, Article 30 with the mappings, things like that first, instead of uh, letting my hair be on fire like so many others. Um, reaching out to more of my peers and 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 building those uh, relationships where we are leaning on each other a little bit more. Uh, so many people are one man islands and and I, I use this reference all the time. My old boss used to say this and it's just so relevant with what we're all doing. We're flying the airplane while we're building it and uh, leaning on peer groups, getting involved in local IPP groups or, you know, other privacy type organizations. I think it's critical. I, I, I've seen a couple of the names on on the uh, the dashboard of our attendees and I, I see a couple of the people out there that are my peers that you know we lean on each other so I would have done that sooner and then um, the DPA like you said you know the contracts group and I we tried to cobble one together for a month before we finally reached out we just kept getting crippled by contracts and requests and uh, I wish I'd raised my hand sooner on that because it would have helped some of the bleeding that we were trying to control so let's turn this on each other a little bit too you know <laughs> I'm trying to think of, you know, what you could have done better w without the guidance from me or the organization. There's really not much I can think of because we had so much stuff going on, like every other organization. It's probably the DPA. You know, I, if I had to get really honest, it would have been, I should have probably intervened a little bit sooner with the DPA. Remember how, <laughs> this is kind of really funny, but true story, and some, some of you go through this. We bounced around. It was like email from legal to, to, to Jen to the privacy attorney. And I, I remember one day I looked at the thread and it was like 26 emails, <laughs> like all over the place. And finally I was like, let's get on a call. And, 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 and I'm going to say this now. Being, one of the things I love about GDPR and, and Jen put out such a great point of reaching out to more peers. We're trying to be transparent, you know? So at Sumo, we're, we're trying to create this environment of being completely transparent. This is what we do good. This is what we're doing bad. This is where we need help. Not only internally, but with our customers too, because we're in this era now that I think the more that you hang on to certain data, especially around breaches, potential breaches and, and solutions that you have, you're not doing anyone any good. You know, it, it, it's time to start opening up with the community. And so getting on the phone is an important thing. And we've learned that lesson quite a bit over this last year, haven't we, Jen? But that was a huge thing. I, 
the DPA was probably the only area where I think you could have probably done a little bit better. But again, don't take that as a hit because you are awesome. And then now kind of, you know, tell me what I could have done better. Well, so you know, back to what I could have done better is I, I think a lot of my peers and in, in, you know, uh, the seat that I sit in, in in compliance, we all try to be perfectionists and we all try to take it on and not ask for help. So uh, that's a lesson I've, I've personally learned over this last year is ask for help sooner than later. So, uh, you know, that that's definitely been a learning spot. Um, I wish I would have dragged you to the, the uh, training with me, quite honestly. I, I wish instead of me being the only one to have gone, I, I wish that uh, you would have been able to go because or I, I would have been able to download to you uh, much sooner than I was able to when I got back because I think that uh, you having more of that understanding of all the things that we had to do with GDPR sooner would have been better. Um, the same with some of uh, you know the ESAF when I sat down with uh, our, our two co-founders and started talking about all the things we needed to do they the, the looks on their face were a little bit white uh, you know our CTO you had the, the moment of, oh, gosh, this isn't just our platform. This is everything. And, uh, you know, getting that, you know, giving that education sooner would have um, been something that I, I, I would have uh, liked to have done with you guys sooner. And that's, you know, again, pointing at myself, I guess, still. So. It's not really because I think that you asked me multiple times if I wanted to go and do things like that. So that's, that's, that's a great point. You and I have always had this thing where, I take the right and what it, or I take the left and you take the right. And I think that yep. I felt like if I would have done all that, we would have both been too much on the right. But in reality, it would have surfaced some things up sooner. So it's a really, really good point. I should have considered that. And your downloads have been great. You know, you've moved me along in the organization along with GDPR in tremendous fashion. So Jen, this one, I'm gonna hand it off to you and then I'll comment, but let's roll through this one pretty quickly and then we can take some questions, but it's not too late. If you haven't done anything to date and privacy panic is starting to set in, where could these people start? Yeah, I mean, May 25th is coming up really soon. We're under two months. Uh, we're not gonna turn to pumpkins on May 26th, thankfully. Uh, ah. So, you know, there, there are things that you can still do. And it's just, you know, first of all, taking that deep breath, <laughs> putting your hair out. Um, and start to, to do the due diligence. If you're showing that you're trying to do the right thing and the supervisory authority comes knocking on your door, you know, it, it's better than you just going, GD what? Uh, so, you know, the first thing, like I said, start with your simple foundational things, your, your data inventory and mapping of flows. Like I said, I wish I had built out that foundation sooner than later. So starting with those pieces and really understanding what types of data do you have making sure you include your vendors. Like I said, it rolls all the way down. And just get a get a baseline of, of those flows. If you need to take a second pass because you're gonna kind of learn things as you go through, that's actually something that you know, I've been doing is I'm, you know, I talk to HR first and then as I'm talking to them and start talking to finance a little bit, you know, there's that tie in with payroll. Things are coming up that, oh, I need to go back and ask them about this. So take that second pass if you need to. Getting your DPA or DPAs in place. Like I said, we've got two very thankful that we've got to. Is it necessary? You, no one's going to die if you don't, but it's been very helpful for us to have the two in place. As George said, we went to our outside privacy council. They had templates. We looked at the templates. We went in and put our information, and we went back and forth with them in a few iterations to make sure that the way we had stated things or the way we had you know, put it into the template was correct and that we weren't misinterpreting anything. That has been incredible we finally that was something that we worked on for quite a bit and we finally rolled it out about a month ago and it has uh, been a lot of peace of mind for us quite honestly so you know doing that and if you're going to sign someone else's gpa like i said don't just sign them blindly make sure you're reviewing them you know what your responsibilities are you know what you're signing on for and then reaching out to your peers doing trainings like this one are there other webinars out there in-person trainings joining groups like uh, iapp and seeking out mentors and peers. I mean, we're all in this together. Um, it's it's not like uh, it's a competition. And and so building that mentor and peer frame, uh, you know, group, I think, is really really important for anybody who's who's dealing with this right now. It's almost a like a you know a support group, not just a peer group. So uh, build that out. That's funny, Jen. I just started laughing. It's almost like a support group. <laughs> it really is. It is. It is. It's a four-letter word, GDPR. So it is a support group. It really is. It comes up all the time. Like I was telling you, you know, I was meeting with that TISO on Monday and we must have talked for 15, 20 minutes around GDPR. And he was bringing up some interesting 
points of view of his own. You know, like he was talking about when we were talking about the DPO, he was like, I, I wasn't going to hire a DPO because, you know, according to the article with DPOs and GDPR, you can't compensate them on overall company revenue. And I'm just not going to ever bring someone like that on my team. And I, I think like all these different like opinions and everything everyone has. And one of the things I told him, I was like, listen, I go, if I was sitting in your shoes today, which I'm sitting in your shoes at another company, drive it from a leadership perspective. Just make sure that executive staff, board members, that everyone is aware of the impact that this could have at the company. You don't want to over rotate your business. Again, I go to the left, you go to the right. You don't want to over rotate your business and cripple it around things like GDPR, but to have the awareness and, and, and the two brilliant things that you said, which are transparency and best level of effort, it's so important for leadership to do that and to make sure that boundaries and walls and any blockers that you may have while trying to drive these programs are removed and removed pretty quickly. So from a leadership perspective, that, that's the advice that I'll give if you haven't started anything yet, is to start driving that awareness immediately. Um, one thing yeah. I did want to make sure we mentioned, and I'm gonna hand it off to you here in a second, Jen, is also hit up Jen's dark reading uh, blog. She's got a blog all around GDPR. Both of us are constantly you know, tweeting about it and writing different blogs up. So just make sure you stay in contact with us and, and continue to look at Cloud Academy as well too when it comes to further training. But at this point, Francesca, I think that we're ready to answer any questions if anything came through. Yeah, sure. Um, let's start from this one. Would you say that compliance with these new rules requires more of a cultural change rather than a technological one? I'll go first, Jen, and then hand it off to you. And so I, I do. I, I think that it's a huge cultural change because in the U.S., in, in the U.S., and I'll say the same thing like if I'm, I'm in the MIA about the U.S. In the U.S., you're just like, oh, Europeans coming at us with something different. Is this really going to affect us? Do I really do that much business in, in EMEA? And I've handled PII in different ways before. It's and it, How many people are they really going to audit? Which is a good point. We haven't talked about that. I mean, they can't audit everyone under the sun. But it's a good cultural change. We should care about PII. And we should care about different kinds of PII. And we should become more of a global type company. You know, everyone should start looking at globalization and how that works and different marketplaces and economies of scale. And so I do think it's a cultural change. And I think it's when it needs to happen. Jen? Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think something that it, people are starting to realize is data is a currency. It's, it's it, one of your most valuable possessions is your data. When you, you give out your information for a free slice of pizza, you're giving away your data. And I, I think more and more people are starting to understand that uh, you know the value of, of what exactly they're giving away and how it's uh, spread all over. You know there were you know there's been a lot of talk about uh, how data is shared. Uh, you know through different applications we use and things like that. So uh, I, I think that's really valuable. That's amazing. Data is a currency. I love that. Tweet that right now. That's a fact. We had one more quick question through. I think we only have time for one more, Francesca. So let me get down to it. It looks like we had a question about the tool that we were describing around Article 30. Um, the vendor that we went with is Trust Arc, and what Trust Arc does is it helps you design workflow around data processing within different business units. And it's something that you can create a report for, like Jen mentioned, PDF it, give it off to any customer or anyone within your organization that wants to see it. And in my mind, it's a great training tool as well to where you can sit down with the different lines of business and walk them through how they're handling data and then have a visual for each step, you know, that they can actually see. So, so Jen, if you want to comment on that for around 60 seconds or so, that'd be great. Yeah, they actually have several. So it's, it's a module within several, you know, uh, things that you can buy. We also bought their assessment module, which allows us to do our privacy impact assessments and data protection impact assessments. They also have um, a, a portal for your subject access requests, the SARS, that are around the data subject rights. Uh, we didn't end up going with theirs. There's a, a vendor that we went with. There's you know several different choices out there, like I said. Um, but yeah, TrustArc is is a known great vendor when it comes to uh, privacy tools, and so uh, definitely check them out for the Article 30 mapping if, if that's something that you all have a need for. Great. At this point, I'm going to hand it back off to you, Francesca, but I want to thank Jen very much. Your insight is tremendous. I, I just love working with you. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you. Appreciate Cloud Academy as well, too. Francesca, you can take it from here. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, George, and thank you, Jen, for being with us today. And thank you to all attendees for joining us. I hope you found this session as valuable as I did. Um, by the way, we will notify you once the recording is available. Meanwhile, if you posted a question that wasn't answered or if you'd like to ask something else to our guests, feel free to reach them via Twitter. You can see their handles on the screen. Thank you so much and goodbye.